one of the first conversations that, ha that is happening at the national level. A lot of us are doing this work in um, smaller groups and have been starting to work on this or working on it for years and years, depending on <laughs> um, their experience. But um, we're starting to bring this um, to everyone's, hopefully everyone's consciousness and, and get working on it. So um, today we're, we're gonna be having a conversation somewhat and then uh, we're gonna save a lot of the session for surfacing some of the main reasons why people um, have a hard time uh, focusing on this as their leader. So we're gonna surface some of those reasons and talk about why those aren't really reasons anymore and we can kind of move past them and uh, get, get to work in. So, um, and then we'll have a good amount of time at the end for questions. We're also gonna share some resources at the end. Um, there were also a couple of documents that were shared on the, um, the conference 2.0. Feel free to take a look at those. That's some work that is being done um, uh, among the production managers forum, which is a, a group of production managers all over the country that are starting to work on, on this a little bit as well. And again, we are just starting in the production managers group, so that's a, that kind of gives you a sense of where we're at in the conversation, whereas, like I said, there's other groups that have been working on this for a long time. So um, we're starting to try to get on the train and, and um, start working on that. So uh, we're gonna introduce ourselves, and then we'd love to just hear who's in the room, since this like um, not too many people to try to get introduced, and then uh, we'll start out. So I'm Tirza Tyler, I'm the Director of Production at California Shakespeare Theater, and I'm also the co-chair of the Diversity Inclusion Committee um, for the Production Managers Forum. Hi, um, my name is Sharifa Joga, and I work at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, and I manage the FAIR program, which is their um, professional development program. I'm David Stewart. I am the academic production manager at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, I'm also here representing the United States Institute for Theater Technology, where I am the chair for the People of Color Network and the commissioner for the Management Commission. <laughs> I'm Jim Streeter. I'm the production manager at uh, Princeton University. Uh, I'm also here as a representative of USIPT, uh, where I am one of three uh, Vice Commissioners for Diversity. I'm the Vice Commissioner for Diversity for the Lighting Commission, and I'm also part of the Diversity Initiative, and I was one of the original mentors for the Gateway Program, which you'll hear about later today. Great, and uh, if you just go ahead and introduce yourself, we're just gonna go right around the room. And I'm Jeremy Adams, I'm the uh, General Manager of the Theater Technology. Rosalind Barber, the Administrative Chief of Staff at the Public Theater. I'm Ellen Kahn, I'm the Director of Finance for Charles Play. Steve Martin, Managing Director of Charles Play. Jay Allegra, Artistic Director of Canola Project in New Orleans. I'm Michelle Weathers. I'm the Managing Director for our Playmakers Repertory Company in Chapel Hill. I'm Jen Collins-Ritter. I'm the Producer at Children's Theater Company. Hi, I'm David Schmitz, the Managing Director at Seven Wolf Theater Company. I'm Mike Schleifer. I'm the General Manager at the Alliance Theater in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm Flori Sieri. I'm the General Manager of Manhattan Theater Club. Daisy Evans. I'm the Managing Editor of American Theater. I'm Addie Gorlin. I'm the National New Play Network producer in residence at Mixed Blood Theater Company. I'm Keely Haddad Null, and I'm the Arts Leadership Fellow at Chicago Shakespeare Theater. I'm Ella Zalon, and I'm a Teen Council Member at Berkeley Rep. I'm Chloe Smith, and I'm also a Teen Council Member at Berkeley Rep. I'm Rachel Eisner. I'm the Education Fellow at Berkeley Rep, and will be the Director of Education at the Berkeley Playhouse. I'm Ashe Bakari, Teen Council Member at Berkeley Rep. Elijah Green, Student Ambassador for Center Theater Group. Tim Jennings, Managing Director of Children's Theater Company and the incoming Executive Director of Shop Festival. Lori Baskin, I'm Director of Research Policy and Collective Action at Theater Communications Group. Uh, Tyler Jabrowski, I'm the Associate Artistic Director at Trinity Rep. Hi, I'm Ann Carol Hess, I'm the Associate Producer at Aurora Theater in Atlanta, Georgia. Donna Cooper, Director of Residence at Willingham. 
Dawn Chang, Lighting Designer. Nancy Schaefer, Education Director and Associate Artistic Director at Dallas Children's Theater. Great, and I think there was a couple other people in the back over there. Hi, I'm Melissa Cashin. I'm the Associate Production Manager and Co-Chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Task Force at Denver Center for the Performing Arts Theater Network. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jeff Gifford. I'm the director of production at Denver Center. I'm Mark Gore. I'm the artistic director at Pacific Conservatory Theater. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, actually, why don't you all come? Oh, I think we can make some room for you here. It would be great if you had some chairs here. bigger question that most of you are asking yourselves is why now? Because someone higher above you told you that we need to be a more diverse organization. What does that mean? Here's the thing it doesn't mean. Diversity is not a number. Let me say that again. It is not a number. The word Quota shouldn't ever cross your mind because it's not. Because if that's how you're thinking, you are part of the problem, not part of the solution. I'm going to make everybody in the room a little uncomfortable in the next five minutes, but you know what? It's about time. We need to be a little uncomfortable. We need to have this conversation. We need to have it now. There is, I've heard people. Gonna steal something from somebody. Melanie Hobson is the CEO of, I know I'm gonna screw this up. Uh, she's the CEO of Aerial Investments. She did a TED talk um, about two years ago. And I'm gonna borrow something she said. She said, We need to stop being colorblind and become colorbrained. Okay, no one even heard that. We all go, and I, I have heard this conversation. Oh, I don't see color. How can you know? Because if you can't see color, you don't see me. You don't. So you have to, we have to stop this conversation about being colorblind. We have to be color afraid. We have to be willing to reach out to all of our, you know, use all of our resources to reach out to everyone who wants to do this, what we do for a living. This is fun. You know, this is, I, you know, I've, been doing this now for 35 years uh, and this is fun so we need to be able to generate that out to people let them know that this is something you can do for a living the other big thing about why we need to be diverse is the ideas that come from it if the only thing you're doing is dealing with one common idea you're short changing yourself you are absolutely shortchanging yourself. Everyone in this room has a different life experience. We need to bring those to the table. Look at the plays we're producing. Look at the musicals we're producing. Look at anything we're producing. We are getting more diverse on stage. We're reaching out to those people and bringing them in. Why aren't we doing that backstage? That's the bigger question we need to look at. Why are we not doing that? There's an old proverb that goes, a lot of different flowers make a bouquet. Simple, it sounds. And it is. We're going to talk about, in the next oh, 20 minutes or so, we're going to talk about resources. We're going to talk about how to connect with them. We're going to talk about expanding your network. The, the last thing I think I'm going to say, because I'll let these guys do a much better job than this, um, we need to start having this conversation with honesty, understanding, and courage. Not because it's the right thing to do, but because it's the smart thing to do. Can I get more? Those of you who um, are on HowlRound, you've probably seen this infographic. This is posted up the other day. One of, uh, Portia did this breakdown of who are 
designers in their fields by gender. Now, she had wanted to do this by race, but this is as close as she could. Okay. As a designer of color, under lighting designers, I am probably a member of a group that is less than 2% of the number of women. I know personally about 30 or 40 designers of color. I guarantee you a lot of them are not in that number. Why? Why? Ask yourself that question. Why? Look at the, the society we represent. We're a good portion of society. Why aren't we that safe? I'll spin the story. Let's see. She was able to look at gender. And those of us who are working in the field, we know, um, you, I'm, I'm assuming you have similar experiences to mine, where we can recognize just by raw, unscientific data that there are more women working in the field than people of color, right? So if you look at those numbers and see those to be drastic, we can use our imagination of what it would look like if they were looking at people of color in those numbers. Um, and those are just the designers, right? So we're not even talking about necessarily the production. She just wanted to be able to look at an area that was much most relevant to her and something that she can actually track, even though the theaters themselves were not tracking. So um, through that, we were we were thinking about what sort of what was sort of timely that we could sort of tie this conversation to and to sort of really make it put it in put it in a place in time so we could sort of reflect on what's going on with us in the field. Um, and looking through the prism of production, I think all of us recognize through our own experiences. That's really tragic. So I work at an organization, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. For those who are not as familiar with the organization, it has, over the past decade, really been um, successful in its um, representation and its consistency in presenting people, directors, and designers from a wide range of backgrounds on the stages. But despite all that hard work and real clear articulation and language and rhetoric, about the importance of diversity, if we, took, if we took a magnifying glass and looked at our own production staff, our own staff in general, some of those numbers look drastically different. So we wanted to have an opportunity to sort of look at an institution who is very much in the weeds of the conversation and seeing that we're certainly not talking from a place of authority and high, you know, we're doing it all right. We have significant issues. So with that being said, if you look at sort of our company-wide numbers, I don't think you can see those numbers anymore. Do you want to know those figures? Okay, I'll, I'll tell them to you so you can you can look at the at the colors <laughs> and you'll get a sense of what the numbers are. Um, so again, the acting company, the directors, and the designers are not in this number. So there's about 500 plus people that work at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. So what that number represents is the 376 remaining people that work there. And if you look at the big blue pie, the entire number, that blue number are white, and that is coming in at 82%. Um, the smaller pie, which looks like a very sort of burnt orange, is 2%, which is Asian. That sort of beigeous, greenish, olive pie is 4%, and that represents black African American. That sort of wider, I don't know, what's that, lighter beige? is an 8%, <laughs> which is um, Latinos. And what's, re what's represented in zeros are our uh, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander communities came in at zero. And this is a snapshot at 2012. So just recognize that we did some numbers in 2012. So there's been some slight shifts, but we're not too far from these numbers in 2015. So this is what we looked at in 2012, April 11, 2012. And for those who are familiar with the organization, people come and go throughout the season. So that date and that year, that's a snapshot, all right? The next number looks 
looked at it through five departments. And we can see the first circle represents administration, the second one is artistic, and the last is production. So we're here to talk about production, right? We're not doing that great in the other areas, but you can see, <laughs> <laughs> right? So no one's on a high horse here. This is just recognizing what the challenges are. And this is after doing some very serious work and trying to move the ball down the field. So in production, 92% of our production staff, 139 people, are white. 92%. What's the average tenure of those employees? So we have people who are in our staff for 20 plus years. We certainly have people who are in our staff for three years. Um, this number represents both our permit staff and our seasonal staff. So there's a wide range of you know, longevity at LSF, but those numbers are startling. And if an, if an organization has made a commitment to diversify its staff, one of the things that we identified in 2012 is we had to look at all of our staff and that we could not be lulled into a place of uh, complacency because of what's happening in our city. So FAIR, very specifically, there was a really quick recognition that FAIR as a tool had the ability to sort of leverage and open up access points to, or to OSF through those production fields. So over the course of the FAIR program that I've been with since 2011, we have hired over 30 people. And many of those people, the overwhelming majority of those people are people of color. So there's a recognition that, okay, if we're gonna change this number and affect it, how can we actually put together a program that brings in people who are skilled, but also allows us to sort of reach our own internal goals? So we're gonna sort of talk about one of the methodologies that we employ to do that, but I just wanted to share with you that despite the hard work, the landscape has been stuck. So if you have not done anything, you still have a tremendous amount of work to do. So part of our charge for you is to get started because that's really the easiest thing. The hardest work is the methodology and the implementation that's required to get the work done, which we'll dive into. Before I do that, I'll turn it over to Jason. Thank you. Uh, how many of you are familiar with USITT? Excellent. So you're like, well, where are all the technicians? Well. Uh, one thing is that I, I decided to conduct an informal survey on the production manager's floor. Uh, we had lost a good friend of ours, Tanisha Jefferson, who's a production manager and stage manager, African-American uh, woman, uh, two years ago. And that really kind of kicked some of us in the butt to get moving on her wishes. So I reached out to the PMF, which has 500 plus members. That's all the product, uh, it's a good representation of the production managers across the United States of America. And I asked, hey, how many of you are people of color? And the results are this. We had 10 that were Hispanic, two of them women. There were six blacks, one of the, or two of them were women. So that means 50% of the black men production managers are sitting at this table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to put that in perspective right yeah. in front of you. Um, two Asian women, one Iranian, one Native American, and one Armenian. 21 people out of 500 plus. And we're gonna talk a little bit about this later, but uh, what I wanted to dive into was more about what USITT is doing. Uh, I'm gonna kind of riff off of uh, what Sharif was saying here about FAIR. What we're, going, what we're working on now is redefining the pipeline. So many times people look at education and say, hey, they're just not coming up, they're not coming up. It's like, all right, you know what? We're gonna poke holes in that in a little bit, but we're gonna really poke a great big hole in it right because what we started doing at USITT is we had the People of Color Network. 60 years ago, there were seven of us, three of us are sitting here at this table, sitting uh, around the table uh, having this conversation at, where were we last time? Cincinnati, Cincinnati. 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 I'm sorry, I'm mixing my conferences. <laughs> we were in Cincinnati and we jumped from seven, six or seven of us to this. Welcome. These are production these are young production people. There were 85 of us. When we were in Fort Worth, there were 45 of us, so they gave us a room a little bit bigger than this. We came in and people just kept coming and coming and coming. And they're like, oh, we have to find a different room. So word is getting out. And part of what is getting the word out is a program that I was co-founder of called the Gateway Program at USITT. The Gateway started out in honor of Tanisha Jefferson. Um, monies were coming in and uh, from 
various sources, and her mother um, wanted to have it go to the best use possible. So she got together with David Grindle, who's the executive director for USITT, and said, what can we do? I want the money to go and be used through USITT. David Grindle calls me up and goes, David, make me a program. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> so I called a, a good friend of mine, Casey, um, who's the uh, production manager at um, OU, and we got together and we started crafting out the Gateway program. And what that was was a mentorship program where we found three candidates who uh, were of color to come in to USITT because one of the par hard things about community conferences are they're expensive access. So with this, we were able to fully fund three students to come to USITT. With that, they got a mentor to walk them through a conference because we have in excess of 5,000 people that attend our conference each year. So it's a daunting conference to go to. So we paired up and we would go, we would walk them through the conference. Well, that was just the beta. Last year in Cincinnati, or this year in Cincinnati, we moved that up to 12 mentees and 12 mentors. So we first select the mentees. We go through a process through the diversity committee at USITT, select the mentees, and then we handcraft and handpick mentors for each one of those mentees. So they get a, a person tailored to them. Uh, so one of, an example is that we had a young lady that was biracial, Asian and, and white. Well, I was like, hey, guess what? I have someone that's Asian and white as well, so I'm gonna hook you up with her. And they got together and became fast friends. And the kind of secondary thing that happened out of the Gateway program was that all of a sudden, a lot of these young people started glomming on to the group because we weren't exclusive. It's like, come on, join up. So all of a sudden, I'm not just with one mentee. I have five, I have this little pack running with me. <laughs> and they just came in and we partnered with PMF and because, again, we'll talk about this in a moment because I, I think at the center of this is production manager. We do the hiring, all right? And so we have to shift a mindset. But what they did is we had the production managers forum come in and do a resume session with these, these young folks to look at their resume so they can present better. Then we had a coffee session so that for any production manager from across the country could come in, have coffee, and meet these young people of color and get to know them. Again, poking holes in the excuses that we hear far too often. The one thing I wanted to add about that photo um, that I like to point out to people is that that group of individuals represents such a small fraction of practitioners who are out there. So many of us who are in this room who are in sort of the recruitment and outreach game, um, you may have interacted with many people who aren't familiar with your institution, well, I certainly have. And many of them have never even heard of USITT. So what that number represents is one, the people who are aware that, that organization exists. Two, the people who have the ability to get there because they, it works in their calendar, they have the availability. And then three, out of those, that small group, who could afford to make that a priority? So when I tell you the small fraction of people that represent, that should not be overlooked. So oftentimes when we talk about the availability of individuals who could be contributors to our organization, it's not mythical to me. It's not sort of theoretical. It's because I've looked into the eyes of people. I've seen their work. I've been to their theater. I've seen how they implement and create work. And I think at the bottom of all of this, to me, before anything can actually happen, before you can make any movement in this area, you have to fundamentally believe that diverse and qualified people exist. That seems very simple, but you have to actually believe it because it will affect how you do outreach. If you don't believe it, your actions will betray you. It's almost like you lose your keys and you know they're in the living room. <laughs> You're clear it's in the living room because you used to open the door, you haven't gone anywhere else, you're gonna move the couch, you're gonna go under the carpet, <laughs> you're gonna move everything because the clarity that you have about where those keys are cannot be denied. When you're not clear about where the keys are, you sort of like, you know, surface look. You go in the bathroom, you, go, oh, you, you might even go out and order another pair, right? That's not an option here because we're not, we're not saying that the option is to exclude people. We're not accepting racism. We're not accepting institutional barriers. You have 
have to believe that the keys are going to live here. Mm -hmm. And you have to believe that qualified and diverse people are out there. When you believe that for real, you will change how you do outreach. You won't be able to help yourself because you'll stop blaming the campuses and you'll recognize there's institutional realities that are not making your institution accessible or attractive. One of the two. It'll become self-examination. What can I do? What can I adjust? How can we modify? It's not about them. It's about my institution. <laughs> Two is candidates are not the problem, the institution is. And once you sort of take that on, what you begin to look at is what are your processes, what are your systems, what do your job descriptions look like? Does a stitcher need to have an MFA? Really? <laughs> are you looking for the skill of stitching? Where do stitchers exist? How is that reality being mirrored in your application and posting process? you're looking for a producer, who has those transferable skills who can produce? Who is steering nonprofit organizations around this country with budgets of millions, with staffs of 40 to 50? Those are transferable skills. If you continue to demand that someone have specific theatrical experience, what it's not relevant, there are some positions Carpenters need to be able to use certain tools. I get that. They don't have to work in theater, though. They have to be carpenters. Mm -hmm. So there's certain skills that you cannot sort of avoid. But when you have positions that really can benefit from the contribution of transferable skills, really tease that out. Because why are, you, why are these artificial barriers? Who are you serving? At the end of the day, garments are being stitched. Wood is being connected. <laughs> People are wealthy. Mm -hmm. You are a place of employment. You are an employer looking for workers. We are in a depressed economy. You cannot tell me that people are not looking to you for work. And when you begin to see your institution as an employer and not an elitist organization that can only function if someone has a certain level of theater experience, and remind yourself, I'm employing people work, you'll start to look at some of your job descriptions. I can keep going. <laughs> I, I'd love to add one thing to what you're saying, too, because I think I would take it even a step further and say, not only should you be looking for those transferable skills because, you know, this person over here who works in a different industry can also sew, so consider that, but actually by, by expanding who is in our departments, we're making our departments stronger and better and more creative. Right? Because the more voices you have from different backgrounds and different um, uh, companies that might be in different professions, right, that might have skills that we don't even have in theater that could contribute to what is happening in our, in our costume shops and our theme shops. So it's actually, I see it as a, a narrowing, right now we're really narrow, right, in terms of what we're using to problem solve and to create art. And the more that we can open that up to different voices and people from other um, fields, but that have the transferable skills, the better, like those will translate around your department, and now you have some extra skills inside that department that you didn't have before. So just a little. I also think yeah, that. Let me, let me take you on back on something too. Um, as a technician, uh, when my kids were little, they would come see my show that I was working on. My uh, in-laws would bring their kids. All of those kids now have a Walnut Street TV. You're welcome. They all have subscriptions to the Walnut Street Theater. They're your audience. You want to talk about being able to grab an audience? Grab a three-year-old kid and let him watch a play. He will love you forever. My daughter, to this day, we kid her about the fact that I could never find all of my swatch books whenever I went to the show. <laughs> because my daughter would be in her room 
under her blanket with a flashlight <laughs> looking at the different colors. You're building an audience member. Not only are you helping your production staff, not only are you getting a more, uh, your ideas are becoming more diverse, you're building an audience. We're nonprofit, but boy, if we're not making money or we in trouble. <laughs> I can't say you go beyond your audience, you're building a community as well. You're servicing the community. <coughs> Shakespeare of it all, and they're like, people, that is cute. But <laughs> I have some other options in New York and Chicago, et cetera, that I want to pursue. Oftentimes, I am extremely successful. Like that's, that's a margin of people that certainly have a tremendous amount of options. But because of the persistence that I have, I'm often <laughs> Let me tell you about her persistence. <laughs> and I may not get them in year one or year two, but the goal is to bring them to the organization. But I also think about it from a very non-selfish point of view. What I, what I try to articulate is that OSF has a significant amount of resources. And even if you're not gonna come and move and be there permanently, I promise you, you give the organization three years, it's gonna be a significant contribution to their own professional growth. We gain from your contribution and I'm good. I don't even, I don't need a lifetime in there. But I, I assure you, there are, there are a significant amount of benefit in coming through the OSF process. But when you look at it that way, when you're looking really for the contribution that you bring to the organization, and hopefully they're gonna be walking away with something, that engagement really leads to a different level of interest in who you are and commitment from applicants that translates into people leaving a really great opportunity to come to a small town in Ashland freaking Oregon. <laughs>
and hopefully that will lead into a question and answer section because these are hopefully going to kind of take care of some of the bigger questions. Um, the first one, which Jim touched on a little bit earlier, was um, uh, saying, I don't support a quota system. And obviously, Jim kind of <laughs> gave neither the do, <laughs> Neither do we. Um, quota systems are what people quote when they don't want to do business. That's how I usually can tell an organization has no, has no desire to do this. When they tell me, oh, I don't support a quota system. Neither do we. Neither does any person of color. I want you to hire me because I'm qualified. I don't want you to hire me because you need a number. Early in my career, I won't, I won't out the union, but I was offered my yellow card for one reason only. I'll let you fill that one in. <laughs> I think this is the reason why this was articulated as our as our first sort of thing that we hear often is because we do hear it often. Yeah. And I, I want to remind people that um, I'm not speaking from a place of you know, I got it all figured out. We saw those numbers, right? We still have a lot. So we're in this together. And I just want to ask if people have had this discussion about quotas or have this thought about how do I how do I work around this quota? Like who's who's been engaged in this quota conversation? <coughs> get it from our, you know, we, we get it from our funders, you know, they want to know percentages of, of our board who are people of color and of our staff. And so, you know, they, they're not, they're not engaging in a conversation about um, quality of workmanship or any of that or uh, and engagement in community or anything like that. It is, you know, we see that only 8% of your staff are people of color. That's unacceptable to us as a funding agency. You need to get your numbers up. And so we get it from another side mm -hmm. um, as far as quotas go. Um, we, resist, we resist that conversation because we want to talk about people who want to be, who want to be engaged with us and we want them to work with us. But um, it kind of falls on deaf ears sometimes when we get marked down for slots because we're not diverse enough according to the quotas that they set. Yeah. Do, do they, uh, just a question, do they also say that about production staff specifically, or is it mostly? Not production staff specifically, but it's the full, the yeah, total that's staff. Yeah, that's the way they're the just staff. curious. Right. I don't know if that brings up an interesting question, which is just when you're met with that idea of um, staffing according to quota, what would, what would you recommend as a way to change the conversation? Absolutely. Um, I think it's really important that um, people understand that the goal is that you're shifting culture. The goal is that you're creating an environment in which bringing my entire self is welcome. And no matter how hard you try, if I'm isolated, you are not, I, I am self-editing my entire self because I don't see a reflection of the welcome in any face or body around me. So what you're hoping for is that you're adjusting culture and the culture of um, inclusion allows everyone to bring their entire full self to an organization and they're not dodging conversations, they're not being groomed by words because the awareness of the organization is so low. What I find is the awareness increases when you have diverse voices who contribute to conversation. In their absence, the conversation is on a loop and people are being groomed along the way. I say that's very common for this group of young people that's in this room we asked them to stand up and identify themselves, and it did take about a third of the session. But it was important because the common thread was, the, the word, the phrase I always heard was, and I'm the only, and I'm the only, and I'm the only. And it ended with tears in their eyes when they looked around and saw the reflection of themselves and that they could be themselves and not self-edit in the room. So I think that speaks a lot to why it's important to, to change this. Oh, yeah, and yeah. just to clarify, my question is not, um, is it important no, no, or no. why is it important, but but actually, because I think oftentimes the conversation about diversity is actually an issue of the concept of, of quota, and it feels like part of what we're saying is we want to change where the, com the starting point of that conversation is. So, like, I'm a director, for instance, so if, I'm, if, if I come to a theater and, and what I'm met with is, so in the casting of the show, it's important to us that you, you know, um, include at least this number of uh, actors of color, for example. 
part of what it sounds like we're saying is that's not a useful place to start the conversation. Absolutely not. So, so the, the question I would say, Ab, you throw back to that, yeah, is yeah, why. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Why? Right. why? Uh -huh. have, have them actually articulate the reason why it is that they want that. Uh -huh. um, and that's going to tell you a lot about the organization. Yeah. Um, because if they, if their whole reason is, well, because we have to fund it. Because some, yeah, as you said before, because of funding or whatever. You just got to ask why. Why are we, you know, why are we approaching it this way? Um, th I mean, and that's it. I mean, that's the only thing I can tell you to do is just ask why and keep asking why. Do, do, what you, do what you have to do to get the show up, but keep asking why. And this is what I can add. I mean, at the end of the day, your, your, your aim is to create a culture of inclusion so you have an organization that is equitable. That's the aim. So um, looking at a person's um, racial identity solely, right, is an old paradigm. If I have a person of color, they're the expertise, they're going to change everything. Um, there's not a recognition that people of color are also on their own arc of racial identity development. So you can have a person of color who's mirroring the same racist, sexist, ridiculousness in an organization if it's not actually, if the culture itself is not prioritized. So what has to happen concurrently, which is my point, is <laughs> the value, like the real value of those transferable skills and the value of the contribution has to be existing in the organization. Because if you do all that work, you get somebody there, and it's drama, they have options, they're out of there. So part of what has to happen is the organization has to be has to commit to a changing of the culture, which oftentimes means creating a process that increases awareness. And for, at OSF, it began at the very basic level. What does racism mean? Terminology, what does it mean? We say racism, we say diversity, we say inclusion, getting really clear about terminology, then understanding privilege, where do we, how is privilege manifest itself, what does power look like, implied power, unimplied power, things that are structured, things that are not structured, um, conscious and unconscious bias, all those things have to be part of the lexicon of the organization. So when someone comes into the org, they can smell and sniff it. If it's a problem, they're out of there. They have options, they're out of there. So you certainly have to till the soil so all of those seeds have a place to grow. So bringing us to uh, the next reason, because I think we're hitting on some of these points that will it'll surface more questions from all of you as well. Um, another one that's really common uh, is, I can't find anyone. I, I, you know, if they applied, I would totally hire somebody. And so, um, so speaks to networking, um, but do any of you wanna take that on? I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, um, as I said earlier, I think it's production managers that are at the, the center of this, in, in, in particular in, in hiring for production. Uh, when I came here last year and I spoke to the group about uh, what USITT was doing, jaws dropped for artistic directors and managing directors and everything. It's like, I never even thought about my production staff being diverse. They're just the little magic theater folks that take care of everything and get everything going. Well, oftentimes the mindset of a, a production manager is, I just lost a welder. I have to hire a welder. Who do I know? My network. My network. There was a study, oh dang it, I forgot to include that. Remember we were talking about the study about uh, out of 100 people, for a white person, for uh, 100 people, they may know a single black person. So if you put that into white, straight, male production manager, which is dominant, that's their network. So they're never thinking about diversifying their pool. They're thinking about getting the welder. I have to get the show up. I have to get the show up. Eight o'clock on Friday, the curtain goes up if I don't get this done. So very often uh, production managers don't think long term in terms of their organization and their culture because it'll, it'll touch base on one of those. Why? Why is it important for us? Well, oftentimes, like uh, Jim was saying earlier, top down is said it's important that you diversify. And if you don't have it, if you don't want to find the keys, you're not going to find the keys. Uh, so I think production managers have to have a, an idea of where the culture wants to go, uh, what the bottom line is for, for the organization, and what is out there. It's not enough to sit there and go, oh, no students are coming up. Oh, nobody applied. I did my due diligence. They aren't coming to me. Well, what are you doing?
to go out to them? Have you inquired at USIPT? Have you gone to the historically black universities to their theater departments to say, hey, who do you have in the pipeline? Have you gone to FAIR and see what they're doing? Have you reached out to TCG and see what they're doing? Have you used everything that is at your disposal? And the answer, more often than not, is no. When I stepped foot in the production manager's forum 10, or oh, sorry, 13 years ago for the first time, I was one of two brown faces in the room. When I stepped into the production manager's forum in Cincinnati, I saw two brown faces in the room. But I, wasn't, come, I wasn't one. You were not one. Because <laughs> I warned him about the world. Because <laughs> oftentimes it's like I would bring up an idea and it would just get off to the side, but one of my counterparts would bring up the same idea and it was like the best thing ever. It's because my experience was not valid because of this. So that conversation is starting to shift with me in production manager, but I think it lies there. You have to have that conversation with your production managers about why is it important and what resources are out there. Um, I, I, I'd love to add real quick um, to what you're saying because the other thing that's important as a production manager is that um, the other conversation that's happening around that table every year with the production managers is that we can't find anybody. Like, they're starting to, because their networks are so narrow, they're starting to actually need more places to look and all I want to say is, especially if you're USHT, because PMF meets at USHT, I'm like, you go down the hallway, around the corner, to room 2C, there's 85 of them in the room right there. Yeah. Can I just ask, who, who feel like this is a real issue for you? Like, look, I, I can't find anybody, which is why I'm in this room. Like, who, what, who, what does that land that? That's where I was at, enough brains. Yeah, I mean, it, but it, it really, it's the suggestions on this for the folks that are charged with this task, because the production manager world is a tough one to sort of knock on when you're coming from a different department, yeah. um, but that is, is charged with this. So. No, I, I actually, I'm going to disagree. Um, being a production manager in the room, which there's only a few of us, I, I don't agree with you. I think it's actually very easy. I think the institution that you're working for has to decide that diversity inclusion is um, a, a way of life for that company. And then they set policy, when you have a job available, then it goes out to this network of places. That's where it gets advertised, period. Then you take it out of, I mean, I, I imagine what Dave is, is expressing about my own circle is probably very true. Um, but when, you, when an institution takes on the idea that we are going to, you know, try and break down that situation and change the color of our staff, then, you know, you don't let the production manager decide, well, I'm only going to send this announcement to this one place. You set, you know, there, there becomes policy that any job that's available goes to this array of places. It just, it gets pushed out to all those places. And then we see what happens. I, I hear that. I want to just remind you though, I manage an internship program. I'm not going to turn the ship of my giant organization. And I've had the same experience. And often it's also worry about the unions and how that's going to fly with the unions. So I, I, are, I totally Are you bringing understand. in production interns? Yes. The union should care. The union should not care. I worked, in, the I worked in Philadelphia for two, I worked in Philadelphia for two summers as an intern. Local 15 didn't care because I wasn't taking a job away from one of theirs. And that's the, the, job union, the unions won't. The unions won't mind. Mostly, and for designers as well, because that's I so admire Fair, and we have not been able to get design interns because there's. I, I feel like I always get the you know. The union is the unionized in these artists, and there is no. 
Yeah. If, if you advertise Teacher for a design room. intern, <laughs> you, will, in the room. <laughs> you probably will get inundated. It, but it, again, we're going to talk about this later. Is where do you go? Like we were talking about the little network. Um, go on Facebook. Honest. Go in and type, and I'm a member of it. Uh, USITT. USITT. EOCF. Right? Uh, queer Nation. Queer, queer Nation. And Women in Theater. Women in Theater. Go on to, um, there's a black theater network that should still be on Facebook. There is an annual, there's an annual or biannual? Biannual. Biannual conference in North Carolina, which is coming up soon. There are places to look. If the only thing you're doing is putting it in Playbill, Art Search, the New York Times, or Backstage, you have limited your pool. Don't be reactive, be proactive. Yeah. I want to pick up on what you said and what uh, he said. And I think that um, this idea of, you know, how can I affect the hiring manager, essentially, or the production manager, whoever it is, because I think at, when I look at my organization, it's also our so I think that one of the things that I just want to underscore is that it will be ideal if anyone who is willing, any ally in the conversation, takes on the responsibility of reaching out, identifying a particular actor. If you become known as the person who's like, you know, meeting people, et cetera, people will start sending stuff to you, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. I have people now who don't hire anyone, but they know that I will go to the ends of the earth to find people. So I have emails coming to me from Stitcher, from Carpenter, you name it. Trepa, I met this person, you're going to like them. Trepa, da 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 It comes from everywhere. Once you're identified as a receiver of people who might come to the organization, people will start sending stuff to you. I think you're absolutely right. The institution has to absolutely institutionalize the process. It would be ideal if there's a baseline of where things are posted that gives you maximum exposure. But I also think another step is needed. Every position should be curated in terms of what are the transferable skills that we can tease out? Where do those transferable skills exist? Because those places need to receive postings too. So there's, it's both and. And just know that you have a lot of power and influence just by having the information of who's out there. So if a posting is put out there for your company, email it to your network that you've created because you care about it. And all they have to do is apply. And if they're qualified, hallelujah, you have affected that hire. There are many people working at OSF right now. The hiring manager has no idea. I emailed that person. I called that person. I begged them to apply. They don't have to know that I was involved. What's the goal? I just want them to be hired. That's all that you have to care about. How it happens, who cares? If you're committed, you have power and influence in the process. I will, because uh, Amanda Burnham Whitlock works for you. She called me and said, I'm trying to diversify our stage manager. How do I do? She was proactive in reaching out and trying to figure out how she could do it in her organization. So I don't think it's just enough to lean on your organization and hope that those policies carry it through, but you have to be vested in this conversation in your own heart. Because if you're not, you're not. It's just gonna, it, I wasn't invested <coughs> in this conversation 10 years ago. For real. I wasn't invested in it. You didn't believe the keys were there. I did not believe the keys were there. Uh, <laughs> but it, it, I had to become invested. I had to have that desire, and I made it happen with my allies that I had, you know, and my friends that I sit around at this table with. Sharif was on me like nobody's business. Like, so this is what's going to happen next. <laughs> I've already booked your plane tickets to OSF, <laughs> and we will be building a pipeline in August. I'll see you then. Goodbye. But there was no buts. It was this is what's going to happen. Um, the other thing that I'd say, just to kind of go back to your question, is that um, we're trying to, that is the point of the Diversity Inclusion Committee that's inside the CMF itself, is to try to figure out how to make it, a, like, give the tools, right, for how to go about doing the change in culture, which is what we're really talking about here, right? Um, and I think that that some of them are who are on that committee are actually in organizations that don't support it. They're still trying to do that work. So there's also just a way in which um, feel free to connect with me or with anybody here about it, but we can, we can also help that person through tools and ideas and maybe 
for me, it's those one-on-one -on -one conversations have been really useful, where someone comes to me and says, either it's come down from on high, my managing director says I have to do X, um, and, and they say, but I don't have any ways of doing that. And when all it is is a conversation, and at the end of the conversation, they're like, oh, wow, I actually have opportunities, I have some network ideas. Like, it's really, again, we're surfacing why these reasons um, are not reasons anymore. Like, they, they're really, are ways of doing this, and I think it's just a matter of spreading the word in a way. So I would love to connect with your production manager, for instance, if they would have a conversation. So if nothing else, give them my email. <laughs> um, so I'd love to move us on to the next one, um, save a little bit of time here. Um, uh, we said, I don't, I don't have time, and why don't I just put it together with, why is it my job to interview for free? Because it's a little bit, we've been talking about all that right now. Right. Um, So uh, one of the questions that we were talking this morning about uh, is why. Why is this important and why is it my job? Um, and like I said, 10 years ago, it, I was a stage manager in a room and my job was to make sure that the actors were taken care of. I didn't understand what my impact as a person of color in the room and nationally could be or is now. Uh, so going back to why is it important I think a lot about uh, how I interact with my boss at, at uh, University of Texas. She brings me in oftentimes on things that are not necessarily in my purview, but she brings me in because I have a very different lens to look at things. And she's like, oh, I didn't think of it this way. I didn't think of that approach. I have a diverse opinion on that. So um, we're able to play devil's advocate with one another and come up with a better solution. Whereas it, it doesn't become just a singular lens that we're looking at this, this one issue. So that's why it's important to me, again, as a production manager, to, to try to be as diverse as possible. Um, just recently at UT, we hired uh, an African American technical director. Uh, and that was important for us, especially in Texas, to be able to show folks that we are here and that there is work that can be had. Um, and to see examples of that, that professional, uh, professional work that can be done. Was, was that person right out of school or did you steal no. it from someone else? I did, I, he was actually a student of mine from the University of Wisconsin when I was there. Um, and I, I, I track a lot of, through Facebook, thank you for Facebook, sometimes. I, I would track a lot of my students' progress. We have uh, the People of Color Network, we have a lot, of, uh, we have the gateway folks, and I track a lot of these students and where they're going, and much like Sharif, I get a lot of these phone calls, it's like, hey, I need, I need, and then the first thing I do is I go to the People of Color Network, Queer Nation, or wherever, and post these jobs, and actually heard a, a, a fair amount of folks at this last conference saying, we are actually able to get candidates from that, that pool. And if they, once they know that you exist, their contributions can be phenomenal. 
So first take the time and think about how can I increase the awareness of my existence? It's great that many people in theater know about us, but we've already identified that people solely in the theater category are not generating the applicant pool that you need. So you have to be outside of the theater category, particularly when it's an institution in a field that historically has been white. You can't look to a field that's historically been white and then require that historical experience to be part of the application process that you are saying you want to be diverse. Do you see the contradiction in that? You have to be able to go outside of that historical reality and tap into the qualified people who have tremendous amount of skills, but have been historically outside of this institution or this field. Well, I'm, just, I'm one of those people. I've been at Princeton University for 25 years. I've been a master electrician, I've been the set school director, I've been the shop supervisor, I'm now the production manager. I don't have a BFA. I don't. I'm a year short. I'm a lighting designer with 125 credits. I don't have an MFA. Gotta look. You gotta look. All right. I'd love to open it up for these last few minutes to talk about any other kind of questions that have been on your mind during this, and of course, feel free to talk with us afterwards. And um, we're going to share some resources right at the very end. So, so what are some questions that are coming up for people? So, the I, I totally agree that the keys are in the room where we got to find them. The question that I find a little, uh, that I'm a little more worried about is how do we support people once we get them here? The, the, the reality is we're historically white institutions, and we're not good at that. And when you're, you know, the first two or three or four people you bring on into your organization of color very commonly look around and go, man, this is not me, you know, and leave. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're having, I mean, at my theater, I would say we've done some good work on that occasionally and some not so good work on that, but you know, the reality of trying to find ways, like I love when Paul, way back when, when we, even before the BNI Institute, when we started that Eliminating Racism in Theater workshop mm -hmm. that you ran, actually. Um, one of the things that really jumped out at me was the conversation about like there weren't any uh, hairdressers in Ashland, Oregon for black women, right? Like it just wasn't a thing. And so why would you move to Ashland, Oregon? You can't get your hair done. I mean, that's a reality, right? How do we support, what are the, what are, what are the advice you'd have for supporting people as they lead and not saying, and not getting into the situation saying, you're the only representative of your race, of your gender, of your in this role, I don't, that, that's, that's, that's not your burden, that's our, that's my burden or our burden. How do we help you, you know? I think that's such a great point you bring up. As I talked about, it's not the candy issue, it's the institution. Yes. So look at the keys, and that hair thing is a really big deal, right? <laughs> so the more people of color that come to the organization, the more the institution learns about the needs of the various communities. And for African American women, black women, hair was like, you were on your own, right? So what do you do if you recognize that you're in a community that's isolated, so we're five hours from Portland, five hours from um, the Bay Area, so you're not going to sprout up a population out of nowhere. So you have to decide, is this an equitable issue? What do we do? You hire an African-American hairstylist. You create a position. So that's what happened. Right. A position was created and a person was hired. So that required a tremendous amount of conversation. Because you ha we have a hair and wig department, right? So since the hair and wig department didn't exist there, there's 10 people every season that wig and style people's hair. They, none of them were required to be cosmetologists because they're, they're literally just running the shows, right? So we said, well, listen, we have a department that's doing this. Why can't we, out of those 10 positions, think about refining one of them, just one, as a cosmetologist who has the expertise to do black women's hair, that we will teach how to run a show. Now, I'm not saying pick somebody off the street. I'm talking about a cosmetologist who has two, three years of training on how to do hair. All we have to do is teach them the necessary steps that it takes to run the show. And we learned, for us, that was a three-week process. You had a 75-year institution that eliminated a group of people because of a three-week process. Because they come with hair skills, hair care skills. They just never had to run a show. And to go to your to, to your kind of culture question too, I think um, I think that that change of culture is for me it's the next conversation like that needs a whole session, 
right? That's what I imagine that because it was too hard to cram that in here as well. But I think figuring out what you need to do, and this does come from us production managers, is how do we create a culture among our staff that um, that is more open and allows for different voices to be heard? Because who you have there already, the question is, are they are their voices? So how can you first change that internal culture to that's, create a place that is, and I do think there's an answer yeah. that can be taken away out of this room, right? So there are resources that are available to you just as members of TCG, right? So TCG has created d &I Institute where they have taken theaters who have opted in to go through this very long room process. For those of you who are not in the Institute, those member theaters have a certain level of learning and understanding that they can share with various people. But ultimately, the goal is to increase the awareness of the organization and tap into people who are actually doing the work with you. It's a phone call. It's a, hey, what was your first step? Well, we did this technology thing, and then we did this. And then you organize that internally. Well, that didn't really work. This, what do we do next? Whatever. You pick up the phone, or if you have the privilege of having the resources to have your own consultant, then you bring your own consultant in to have those conversations. But depending on what resources you have, those are the steps that you take. But TCG has those resources available to share with anyone who's willing to get started. You just have to ask. Um, other questions? <laughs> well, let's go ahead. This is a, kind of going back to the basics, but if you do not have the institutional support, and you know, I never had someone say to me, no, I don't believe in diversity, or no, I'm not gonna, you know, everyone verbally agrees to it. But if you in reality don't have the institutional support, if you have suggestions for either working, you know, from the bottom up or to, you know, other ways of convincing the organization. One thing I can say and um, is that part, part of what we found really valuable in the diversity inclusion committee that we created for the PMS is that we have monthly conference calls where all we do is share the, t the small things that we're doing in our, in our um, cultures, right? In our cultures and expanding networks and, hey, I tried this one program where I brought in um, a, someone who had worked in construction and brought him into the shop and this is how it went. You know, there's like this, this sort of sharing that I think is really good and we have no resources in the PMS. We are just a network of people. So, so that is how, like, and it's been incredibly valuable, like people really, of all the things that the committee has been able to do so far, and we've only, by the way, we started in March of 2014, so it's it's a short <coughs> amount of time, but we feel like that's been a really valuable resource, is just sharing like what's been happening. So I think reaching out to people, so that's one, one thing to consider as well. Anybody else? I would just add that you look for the other ally in your org, I don't care who it is, yeah. and you guys begin to meet on a regular basis, and you share your observations, you share your concerns, Initially, there might be a lot of tears and a lot of woe, but then what happens is when you get through the pain of it all, you guys begin to start strategizing about steps, and you continue to add a person to the team. Sometimes it might just be two. If you're lucky, you might have five, right? And then if you find other people in other organizations who are like-minded, you expand that out. You put together a monthly conference call. You get the confidence to take the first step. You might get beat down. Okay, fine. Don't give up. Racism is not an option. Racism is not an option. So you go back in, but you have a cohort. Working in isolation is a death thing. You're alone, you're fatigued, you have no one to bounce things off of. You need to find at least one ally in the world. I don't care who it is. It does not have to be leadership. If you guys go together and take that information up, keep bringing it up until it penetrates. So, um, yeah, go ahead and then we need to.
Yeah, just as one add-on, I think what, it, what's great, what has been great for me, I have been at Playmakers with um, Joe Hodge for about eight months. And what has been great is he called it a plurality of voices. Right, so we don't talk so much about diversity and inclusion. What we're talking about is a plurality of voices. And that means women, that means of any gender, um, you know, gender identification or color. So you can have those difficult conversations and make those mistakes and use words that um, help you feel, feel better about it. And so I have discovered that also when you say plurality of voices, that means so many things. Right, and it makes it easier to then say, I, I said this plurality of voices thing, but then I'm probably gonna say something that's gonna not be right, but I, I know that that's, that's what we're looking for. Please. Thank you, everybody. So we're actually out of time, and they're gonna kick us out. If there's other questions or offline conversations,